So I'm here to talk today about smart contracts. And uh, the intention of this presentation is to provide individuals with little or zero information or experience or knowledge around smart contracts and decentralized applications and give them some knowledge, gives them some information that will hopefully lead them down the path to being part of the development or developing these dApps. Um, I am a software developer by trade. I didn't wear a t-shirt, but hopefully the rolled up sleeves gives me some street cred. But uh, um, so I know that there's some technical people in the audience and some non-technical people in the audience, and I want to assure you that I'm going to provide some deep technical information, but I'm also going to provide some valuable information for non-technical product people, entrepreneurs, business people, that you can at least learn some lay terminology and be able to have an effective conversation with um, you know, developers or a team that's going to be creating or developing a decentralized application or smart contracts. So let's start with some basics. What is a smart contract? We all know what contracts are. I, everyone executed a contract when they signed on the line for this conference. So everybody's part of a contract. And smart contracts are contracts. They're binding agreements between two or more parties. Whereas traditional contracts may be uh, executed in a formal and legal way. They may be enforced by laws or courts of law, maybe even lawyers. Smart contracts are self-executing, and they are enforced by computation or machine code. So just as in traditional contracts, you might have stipulations or procedures that need to be met in order for a contract to be executed. Um, we also have this in the smart contract world. Smart contracts use mathematical operations to enforce those procedures. And these mathematical operations are happening on the blockchain, specifically with, in, within the Ethereum virtual machine or on the Hedera platform. These mathematical operations are obviously hard to argue with. I'm, I'm still trying to argue with math, and I just haven't succeeded yet. But most importantly, in the terms of dApps or decentralized applications, smart contracts are both the core and the building blocks for decentralized applications. I'll show you how. So what are dApps? Dapps are decentralized. They're decentralized applications. And if you think about traditional networked applications, you've got some sort of entity that creates that application, governs that application, controls the policies and the terms around the community that uses that application, and most importantly, they control the distribution of that application. So most of the applications that we know and use daily, those are centralized applications. Think Google, Netflix, Facebook, Twitter. These are all centralized applications. Now, decentralized applications, they limit that central authority. And what that does is that offers more freedom, more applications to empower individuals using those applications. DApps are open source. They're end-to-end -end applications. End-to-end, -end, there's transactions that are recorded on the blockchain. Through smart contracts, we can say that they're bound to this blockchain or the hash graph by smart contracts. And it's this, the transactions that are recorded or appended to the blockchain or hash graph, this is the intrinsic value of the data of these applications. So this is all being driven by these recorded transactions. Every, all, the, all the applications that we've seen today, the intrinsic value is that transaction. So when we limit this authority, which has implications on the control of our personal data, implications in areas such as free speech or open marketplaces, or even the transparency of supply chains on bringing goods to consumers. So what we are beginning to see is many observers in the industry are beginning to label this Web 3.0 technology or the next innovative leap in web application technology. So let's take a look at some history. 
So we've got web 1.0 apps. We're all familiar with those. I would argue that by far and large, most of the applications that we see on the internet are web 1.0. Nobody labels them web 2.0. They're just the original version. Oftentimes, this is a simplified uh, diagram, but you would have you know, a centralized database, which is that value that I'm talking about, the data. It's where is the data. The data may be stored in a database or on a file system if it's just a simple website with web pages. You might have a server, an application server, a web server that manages the publishing or the mutation of that data, and it may provide web pages or mobile views if you're using a mobile app. And the client's viewing those pages, those rendered pages in a browser. And this is the way that it was done originally 20, starting 25 years ago, and still, for the most part, it's done that way today. Now, Web 2.0 came along, and the application layer started to shift a little bit, where in order to have more richer experiences, the serving of data became more of a thin wrapper, and we call this an API layer. Um, generally, you would have APIs that do that, the publishing or the mutation of that data, and the actual application is being moved to the client side, and we're seeing that as far as the emergence of JavaScript web applications or mobile applications where you can have this application running without, but in order to make it valuable, you have a connection through the API to the data. I would, I would argue that Google Maps is probably uh, the best example of like the Web 2.0 revolution. When, web, when Google Maps came out, it was like, oh, wow, we can do this. And they weren't the first product to follow this pattern, but probably the most disruptive since everything after that became, they kind of set the bar for everything else. And it also started to change business models. And we started to see different kinds of Web 2.0 business models evolve or emerge. Now, what people are calling Web 3.0 applications, which I wholeheartedly believe that this is the next wave of the internet, uh, we have the databases being replaced by the blockchain or the hash graph. Um, and this is the data that I'm talking about is that valuable intrinsic data that gives applications meaning. It may not hold all the data for an application. You wouldn't have the entire contents of YouTube on the blockchain, but you may have the transactions that happen on an application such as YouTube recorded on the blockchain in order to monetize that. So the application layer is now replaced somewhat by smart contracts. And we'll talk about smart contracts using the Solidity programming language. And then again, we have this Web 2.0 kind of application layer that happens on the client side or in the mobile SDKs, whatnot, if you're using mobile phones or tablets. So what are the components of a decentralized application? Obviously, there's a blockchain or hash graph, and there's on-chain data, and this is the, as I mentioned, this is managed by smart contracts using the Solidity programming language. You might have off-chain data as well. Again, I give you the YouTube example, or you'd look at an application like DTube. If anybody's not heard of DTube, I encourage you to go to d.tube in your web browser, and you'll see a decentralized application that kind of mimics what YouTube is doing. Now, the video content, you wouldn't necessarily want to store that on a blockchain. It would get very expensive very quickly. So you'll go to other sort of mechanisms. And you may see people using centralized file storage. It may not be as usable or offer the same benefits as decentralized data. But you might also want to explore something like IPFS or SWARM. IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System, which is a decentralized file system. Uh, think of Napster or BitTorrent, where you have a peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes that uh, serve up those files based on hash identifiers. And the client applications most popular today um, are obviously the JavaScript web applications that can also be ported to mobile devices, uh, namely React.js or Angular.js. And you have this protocol bridge, which is uh, you have this client-side application happening, 
you have the smart contracts and you need to somehow bridge the communication between the two. And what's normally used today is Web3 and we'll discuss that as well. So let's talk a little bit about Solidity programming language. Solidity programming language is open sourced. It's a curly braced language. So if you are a developer and you're familiar with uh, Java or JavaScript, uh, it will look very familiar to you. It has static typing. It has inheritance. It's the basis for smart contracts. And it, it compiles to assembly code. So the assembly code is the procedures, the, the computational procedures that I mentioned that drives those transactions. Those are the rules. Uh, pro, the Solidity language kind of gives even programmers a, an, an easier view into what's going on logically in a program. And we'll look at some code. And it's the assembly code, or the compiled code, that actually runs on the blockchain or in the EVM or on the Hedera platform. And this is what makes it easier to port Solidity to other platforms, is that all they have to do is figure out all the procedures of the assembly code. So here's an example of some Solidity code. Um, I, this won't look, this will look like Greek to many people. For some people, they might be familiar with black screen views. Uh, but we have a pragma declaration which says, hey, I'm going to build a contract in the Solidity language and I'm going to need a minimum version of this. Versioning is important to know because as the language evolves, you want to make sure that whatever's running your contract knows all the declara declarations and the language that you're using. The basis for um, any contract is the reserved word contract. And here's just a simple coin contract which has some types here. It has a uh, public address for the minter or the person who's executing this contract, which is the sender. Uh, we have some events here like let's mint some coin and give it to uh, a recipient. Uh, let's have some rules around here. Yes, we have to have a balance uh, in order to send money. Uh, we've got a transfer function. This is basic, your basic kind of coin smart contract. So let's talk a little bit about some tools that you're going to want to use as a developer if you want to get into Solidity programming. We'll talk about the Remix IDE. We'll talk about Truffle, Embark, Open Zeppelin, and again, we'll talk about Web3. So the Remix IDE is a browser-based application. You'll find it at remix.ethereum.org. It's got Solidity language support. It's probably the easiest way for anyone to be able to immediately start writing some smart contract code. It's got built-in um, compiler. You can run contracts. You can test them. You can analyze your contracts. Um, it's going to provide basic smart contract editing. Um, again, it's a great tool for just learning the language. As soon as you've gotten the basics, you're going to want to move on to better tools. Um, Truffle is another tool that offers a number of command line uh, commands that uh, you can easily install. You might recognize, if you're a developer, you might recognize the npm install Truffle. That's as easy as it gets to just get this Truffle running up on, on your system. It provides unit testing. It provides uh, migration, deployment. It allows you to get test networks up and running. So you can test your uh, smart contracts in a, in a real-world scenario. And it also includes some useful project templates, which Truffle calls boxes. And boxes are kind of prepackaged example applications that you can build upon. So if you also want to learn more about building, say, applications, Remix ID is more for smart contracts, but if you want to build end-to-end -end applications, Truffle has some boxes that you can pull down and be able to use and analyze the code and extend it. It kind of gives you basically a template. It's definitely a more advanced tool than Remix ID, way more powerful. Um, once you get past the basics, you're going to want something like this. This is some basics to get you up and running if you have a Mac operating system. You're going to brew install Node. You have to have Node in order to use the Node package manager. You'll want to install, install the Ethereum client, which is the uh, Go-based Ethereum client. 
install Truffle, install the Ganache CLI, which is also enough, another Truffle product. And here we're going to just make a directory called Lugal. We're going to CD in there, and we're going to Truffle Unbox React. And that's going to give me a React.js end-to-end decentralized application that I can compile, I can test, and I can develop on like immediately. And I can change into the directory of the client, run npm start, and I've got a web browser popping up with you know, some application running on a port. The Embark framework is very similar to Truffle. It's more of an end-to-end -end framework. So if you want to get more of your basics, give me everything. Uh, you know, Embark's going to be probably more suited for you. Again, you can npm install Embark. It's good for testing. It does some code generation, so it can actually build some code for you. You can just build any product by just saying Embark new product name, and it'll give you something. Um, it's likely easier for Truffle than beginners. Again, I think that Truffle's more of an advanced tool that you may end up using if you're going to go down this track. So the Embark, here's an example of getting an Angular application up and running with a Embark. Again, we need Node and Ethereum, and then this one actually, Embark optionally wants to have IPFS as its file storage mechanism. IPFS being the interplanetary file system. If you install IPFS, it'll want to get it up and running as a node on your computer, so you'll actually be running as a peer within the IPFS network. And then I can install Embark, and I can say, hey, give me a new application. So Embark new app name. And then here I'm passing in a template parameter, which is very much like the truffle boxes. It gives you templates so that you can get up and running with a blank application and get started by actually having code generated for you. So the Open Zeppelin pro project is very important to talk about, because as I mentioned, that smart contracts are the building blocks of decentralized applications. So the building blocks and the inheritance model within Solidity allows you to inherit other existing contracts. So if you can think in terms of traditional contracts where you know, I may be a landlord and I want to rent out a house to a tenant, and I don't want to write that contract myself because I'm not a lawyer, but I can actually go on the internet and I can probably buy a template for $25 that's going to give me a starting point. Well, this is kind of what Open Zeppelin provides. It provides reusable solidity contracts as building blocks that you can build upon. And this is also a great way for learning the solidity language and what smart contracts do. They're open source. They're tested by a community. So there's some security built into it just by having that peer oversight. You can use it with Truffle and Bark, obviously, or Remix IDE. And, uh, some of the things that Open Zeppelin provides is access control, crowd sales, tokens. For example, you can mint your own ERC20 token, start your own ITO. Easily done by importing the Open Zeppelin standard token contract and just decorating it with some information. Say, I want an ERC20, and I'm going to call it Lugal, and the public name's going to be Lugal Coin. And when I mint it, I'm going to give myself a gazillion uh, tokens, and I'll be a crypto millionaire uh, just by running this thing. So Web3, again, is that bridge. And I just want to touch on that again briefly. Web3 is that bridge between client-side applications, smart contracts, Web3.js is obviously the JavaScript library, but there's other implementations. There's an implementation for Java. There's an implementation for Python and other languages. The Web3.js uses the JSON RPC protocol, so it does remote procedure calls on smart contracts. It can listen to the events happening within contracts. It bridges web applications. It can be used with React or Angular. So I hope I've given you enough information to at least, as a developer, you can get started and going. If you're a layperson, you at least 
have some terminology and some, a little bit of an understanding about what smart contracts and decentralized applications are. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.